Notice when your kids begin to serve the Lord, they're always smarter than you. They're always smart. Though, um, I must say, Ron and Debbie, uh, we're praying for your son, son-in-law, Steve. Uh, not just for his healing of his ankle, but for the mind of Christ that he doesn't jump that high again, too. But anyway, man, that's something. And so be praying. Is he going to have sur- surgery on his ankle, right? And so let's make sure we're praying for Steve as well. And how many of you know there's people that have jumped in the water and it's been a little bit too shallow before? Johnny Erickson, much worse outcome. And so we praise God for God's mercy and the blessings of the Lord. I used to think I was smart, but my daughter-in-law, who's a scientist and a science professor, uh, taught for 10 years in Iraq. She's from Kurdish background. And um, the more I watch her do her mathematical formulas that you're doing for the friend of the family there, I realize that there's certain areas I'm not very smart at. I just told um, Pastor Steve here, I said, we've got to get away because I want you to teach me how to golf. And he's coming up with excuses. So we're going to be getting T-shirts for everyone, and it's called Teach Pastor How to Golf, okay? And we're going we're to get that done because how many of you here, there's a sport you wish you could do, but you don't know that you have the capability? Like for me, being a center on a basketball team. So that happens. You know, Covenant. Covenant. Remember I told you the story? You remember, you remember the hunting dog story I told you about? The guy who was the atheist and the dog? How many remember that story? Did I, t- I, I, have to, I tell this story so often, I have to have told it here at least once. You remember this guy? He had a dog who had really supernatural talent. And he had a neighbor named Zeke who was a total atheist. How many of you have anyone in your life who's an atheist? They don't believe in God. Next time you sneeze and they say, God bless you, that's called a hypocritical atheist, okay? But anyway, um, and this guy, Matthew, so wanted to get Zeke to know the Lord, he had a black Labrador retriever, which is what I grew up with, and this was really a unique dog. This was a dog who kind of like walking on water. He went, he went duck hunting with his neighbor, and uh, he had a browning 12-gauge over and under, and so there's Zeke, and Zeke um, shoots a bird, and it falls right on the lake there, right on the pond. And the dog runs out on the water and doesn't even break the surface, the plane of the water. And he gets the mallard duck and puts it in his mouth and he brings it, welcome friends, and he brings it um, right to the shore, but he never even got his paws wet. And Zeke is just looking and doesn't say a word. And, and Matthew's thinking, this is going to bring Zeke to the Lord when he can see what Jesus can do through my Labrador Retriever. So then Matthew shoots a mallard duck and it hits the water and um, the dog runs out there and never breaks the plane of the water. And you know, Labradors are great hunters if they're trained properly. Does this three times and Zeke never says a word. And finally Matthew looks at him and he says, Zeke, to the atheist, have you noticed anything unusual about my dog? Because I mean, you know, it's unusual when a dog can walk on water. He says, as a matter of fact, I did. The poor dog can't swim. <laughs> How many of you know people see things in different ways? Not all people have faith. Even if you see a miracle, not all people have faith. Our doctor, when my wife's cholesterol during revival, we just prayed for her, went from 340 to about 132, and she comes from a family, it's a, heredi- it's, it's a genetic problem, where they don't have the necessary amount of receptors on the liver to deal with the bad cholesterol. And yet, it went down, and I mean, God did a miracle. And our doctor at the time, Chris Miller, who also is an atheist and a friend, you know, I've got some, hey, God loves atheists too, right? And he kept saying, we must have done the blood work wrong. And I said, Chris, Let's look at her, I keep all blood work, always. Let's look at her last eight tests over the last decade. She's been in the high twos and the low threes the whole time. Well, and it was easier for him to believe there were eight wrong tests than a miracle that God did. Not all men have faith. Now the scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it goes on to say we must first believe that he is, and we must believe he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, you must believe God is, God can, and he wants to do it for you. You know what I've learned? Steve, I don't know if you can relate to this as a pastor. I've prayed for so many people, and I've seen miracles. I've seen God do healings. The hardest person for me to believe that God can work in his life at times is me. Is me. 
Isn't that interesting? And so I have to constantly encourage myself in the Lord in realizing that. Well, entering into intimacy and covenant with God requires faith. When I married Marge 40 years ago, I've known her for 42 years plus now, 42 years and two months to be more precise, I had to have faith that this was a marriage where she would be full of faith or faithful to me and I'd be faithful to her. I had to have faith that as we grow together, who knows what's going to happen in illness and financial struggles and in, church, in churches, you can have challenges at times. Will she really still be um, my best friend? Will we still be in covenant? Covenant takes faith because the Bible's already given us this precursory concept that men will always fail you. But I, Jesus says, will what? Never what? Never leave you nor forsake you. And this is important. We serve a God who is so covenantal. He says, even when I backslide, when I screw up, since I'm the bride of Christ, he says, he is married to the backslider. We have to get a sense. It takes covenant to believe that the God of eternity would come this season in human flesh and want to have relationship with me. How many of you, you're, you're like me. It's not an inferiority complex totally, but there's times you're surprised with, you know who you are. I know who I am. And yet my heart is above all else, the Bible says, deceitfully wicked, twisted, okay? Who can know it? Well, the reality is I'm going to be up front with you. I am shocked by two things, that Marge has been so deeply in love with me and committed to me all these years. She's really easy to love. She's really easy to be committed to. She is just, I mean, if she would have been a dog, which I'm not comparing her to a dog, she would have been a golden retriever, just faithful, always wanting to have fun, and... Um, and she licks my face. But other than that, you know, uh, and you can determine which of the three are not true. But, you know, the point being that she's just so covenantal. I'm not saying I would have been a pit bull or a Rottweiler, but you get the point. And I'm sure they're just great dogs as long as I don't have one. So just a little review. What is a covenant? What is a covenant? Thus far, we've covered the covenant of life, or what's also known as Bereshit, that's for Genesis, the covenant of beginnings. And what we've been doing here now is we're looking at where the only covenant that did not require blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, so it requires blood to cleanse sin away. That's where the Jews get Yom Kippur, the day of coverings, or the day of atonement, and this is why the blood on the cross, people wonder, why would Jesus have to die for our sins? Why is there shedding of blood? It makes sense. But you see, the very first covenant, the very first covenant did not require blood. Think of this. Nothing was designed to die in the beginning of time. There was this eternal nature or substance, if you will. But you see, when the covenant, let's see if you remember now, when the covenant of life, the covenant without blood, meets the Adamic covenant, this will be the first covenant where blood is shed on the earth. What was it called? I gave you one word last week. It's called something we used to have in school that we sweated bullets, we dreaded. It's called? Very good. Who said that? Very good. Excellent job there, Lisa. Lisa pays attention. She takes notes. She might get the Student of the Year Award here tonight. But anyway, uh, it's called the test. There is a test. Remember, friends, how many of you have ever flown in an airplane before? I'm reading on, um, I'm, I'm doing something very interesting. I'm reading on 9-11 right now in 2001. And I'm reading about a town, Gander, in um, uh, New, New Finland, where um, so over seven, the, the population there is 9,000 people. It's what, it used to be the largest airport in North America. I don't know if you knew this, but once they redesigned jets to be able to not have to refuel, this was the busiest airport. This is where you'd have to stop to refuel. Albert Einstein would have to go there to refuel. Just giving you some people here. Uh, and I could give you a list of celebrities. Frank Sinatra would go there to refuel. How many of you have ever been to New Finland? I've been there. And that is like, um, it's like an Iceland. This is the place where you would go to refuel and it's an island, and it's a phenomenal place. And I'm reading about in one day's time, in, on September 11th, 
38 airplanes with 7,000 people were diverted to New Finland and the Canadians did everything and anything to protect these world travelers. It's quite an interesting story and I'm actually working on a series that's very relevant to some scripture that we're gonna talk about as I bring it together with the Kinsman Redeemer and the Book of Ruth. But that's a whole other story. That's gonna take me about two years to put it together. I'm on my fourth book on the subject right now, but it's something that's fascinating. And, uh, but you'll find in order for there to be a covenant, uh, like an airplane, before I get on an airplane, how many of you are thankful for test pilots? How many of you are thankful that somebody has gone before you to look at the reliability and you have to test something. How many of you are thankful for all the test studies for medication in pharmacology before you actually take that medication? And you see, with the covenant, Adam and Eve, there could never be an authentic or a genuine relationship with God if they were never tested. This is the tragic flaw in Calvinism and Arminianism. A free will concept has tragic flaws as well. Calvinism, everything's predestined and that's just the way it's going to be or what have you. But you see, the reality is that there has to be a test. There has to be a choice. You see, what makes my marriage really matter to me, and I think matter from God's perspective, I have to have a choice to not be faithful to March. And by the way, if you've screwed up before, get it under the blood, get on with life, because every time I've been unkind to her, that's faithlessness. So it's sin is sin. Let's put that in perspective. But the point being, you have to have a choice. The prodigal son, in order for him to have an authentic and a genuine and a meaningful relationship with his father, he had to be willing to go to a far off land, which in Greek means forgetfulness of God. He had to have the opportunity to say no to God. So, so often we freak out when our kids sin or when our kids do things wrong. Isn't it crazy how we never sinned and our kids do? That was a joke. How many of you know where they got their sin nature from? It starts with Adam and Eve. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And so we mentioned last week, what if man had passed the test in the Garden of Eden? I've been thinking about this. I've really been thinking, what would have happened? Uh, one of you would have blown it. How many of you think somewhere along the line, if Adam and Eve said no to the forbidden fruit, there might have been one outlier who might have partook of the forbidden fruit? How many of you want to look in the mirror? I think any of us would have been ultimately in that situation. So why did man fail the test? As we're concluding on the Adamic covenant. First of all, we've learned in our big idea, there is no life independent of covenant with God. There is no life. Friends, we have substituted covenant for a sinner's prayer. And I believe in the sinner's prayer. I believe that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, we've been through this before, the importance of asking him into your heart. But you see, to, if I, here's, here, here's the sinner's prayer in my marriage. Marge, I love you. Will you marry me? And we have vows with one another and to sickness and in health. Friends, that's not covenant. That is simply a confession of faith. It is a covenantal commitment. But the reality is, after the honeymoon, I didn't get to say to Marge, that was a great honeymoon. Hope you have a great life. Why don't you write me once in a while? Email me. Let me know how life's going for you. No, it's what we did after the honeymoon. It's the ongoing relationship that makes it a real covenant, if you will. So there's no life independent of covenant with God. Many of us, we did not get saved. We got a religion when we prayed the sinner's prayer. And that's why we're wondering, why am I so attracted to the shiny thing in the water? Why is it I can't fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith? Why am I lusting after another woman or another man? Why, is, why do I love money, which of course we know is the root of all evil? And the reality is, friends, and you have to hear this, we have bought into a lie that if I will come here and just say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner, come to my heart, be my Lord and Savior, I believe you die for da, 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 I'm saved. We, we th but the reality is, the Bible doesn't just say, may the words of my mouth, but it's also the meditations of my mind, intellect, and uh, my, my will, my personality, you know, overall, may, may the words of my mouth are the meditation of my soul, who I really am when nobody's looking, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So what, were, what, were, what was the real consequences of failing the test? 
Because you see, if you don't understand the covenant of life and the Adamic covenant, and even when we get into the Noahic covenant in the next couple weeks, we're going to have to keep going back to Adam. It's going to keep going back to Adam. Even when we understand the second Adam, ultimately, in a number of months, that's Jesus, we have to keep going back to the first Adam. Because there always will be a choice. Uh, who wrote that song back in, the old, back in the 70s? Was it Randy Matthews? I'm trying to remember. Which side are you on, boys? You've got to pick a side. Or um, did Randy Matthews write the other one? You've got to serve somebody. Let me help you out. No matter who you serve today, you serve somebody. Whether you serve yourself, whether you serve Muhammad, whether you serve Buddha, whether you serve Krishna, whether you serve Joseph Smith and the beliefs there, whether you serve your wife or your husband as if they're the only person hand, in, hand, in, hand over foot. The reality is you're going to serve somebody and the reality of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is really make sure you're serving and loving and following Jesus Christ. First. Because if you serve Jesus first, if you seek Jesus first, then guess what? Everything else comes right into context. So what were the consequences of failing the test? Genesis 2.17, this is not really review, it's taking it to the next level. But you must not eat from the tree of what? The knowledge of what? Good and evil. For when you eat of it, you're a dead duck. You shall surely die. Now, this is where my life may be different than yours or might be the same. I always find myself at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil daily. That's why I have to crucify my own man daily. I have to die to Bill daily. How many of you can relate to this? I, I, I have a choice in my attitude, in my mindset. You know, people often say, what do you do when the butterflies leave your tummy? You know, uh, when you first meet that girl, you first meet that guy, and you're on the phone till 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., or you fall asleep on the phone talking to each other and everything else. And I'm here to say, we're setting people up for failure because not, that, that's not the issue. That wasn't love. That was lust. That wasn't love. That was lust. I thoroughly enjoy hanging with Mara. She's my main squeeze, the cream of my coffee. I mean, I, I love her. The reality is, though, we're not talking about the lust. When you get beyond the endorphins in your brain, the testosterone, the estrogen, the DHEA, the progesterone, and the chemical laboratory of your mind, and as you're getting older, what is love really? And when you have a covenant, covenantal love, it's not a ball and chain. It's not like, I have to love her because I said I do, and now I'm done, and now my wings are clipped. There is something so supernatural that takes place there. We have to teach our kids covenant. But this was the essential term of the covenant of life. The day you eat. The only condition. The only condition. All of God's covenants are conditional. God's love is unconditional, but the covenant's conditional. Does, what does the Bible say? If you do this. This is a key transitional word in Hebrew for covenant. If you will do this, I will do that. If you do that, guess what? I'm going to have to do this. And it's all based upon choosing this day who you're going to serve. Do you want life or death? Do you want prosperity or poverty or so on? But here was the term of the covenant. Eat, eat it, and you shall surely die. Now we've got to look at this for a minute because it's very important to covenant. If I walk away from the God of unconditional love, and the Greek word is agape, and I identify with the self-serving one, I have literally walked away from life itself. How many of you ever met somebody, if God was a good God, he wouldn't let this happen, he wouldn't let that happen. Or people look at their life, why am I impoverished? Why am I always struggling? Why am I always unhappy? And yet we fail to actually take an inventory and an internal audit of our own life and say, because I've made some bone headed decisions throughout my life. Friends, if you're where you're at financially, you can blame anybody. Well, my husband left me, but often your parents said, don't marry him to begin with. And that's not being condescending. That's not being condemning. But here's what I've learned with the Lord. How many of you are like me? You've made boneheaded decisions before. How many of you? If you haven't, then you're a bonehead for not admitting it. How's that? You know what I'm saying? We all have. 
Every one of us. That's why we need a Savior. If we, didn't, if we weren't drowning, we wouldn't need the Savior. That's the way it works. And I've learned when I say, Lord, I screwed up. I've blown it. I am, I am so dumb, I couldn't be any dumber. How dumb can I get, be and still breathe? And I admit it, and all of a sudden, I find out I'm smart. I find that his thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and his ways are not my ways, if you will. The day Adam and Eve walked away from God, they voluntarily walked into death. They had a covenant with God. But this is where the covenant takes off. Your marriage is not defined by the good times, but by the bad times. Marge and I have learned we have a covenant when things ain't going well. Me and Mrs. Wilson got a good thing going, but the reality is, it's who are you when you've been defrauded? Who are you when things are falling apart? Who are you? And this is what covenant is all about. But they voluntarily. It wasn't God said, the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man, I'm going to kill you. It's over. Turn off the lights. He's saying, no, you will be, as you voluntarily walk with me in the cool of the evening, he says, you're voluntarily walking away from me into your own personal demise. Do you get that? And so a lot of us, we go, why is my life the way it is? And when I sit down with people, this is why we do prefer really upbeat, positive churches that tell people that have no regard for God, you're doing great. You just follow these seven points, man, and everything's fine. But we forget if they haven't been transformed, not reformed. Religion reforms you like reform school, but Jesus transforms you. That's why it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Stop beating yourself up. Behold, all things become new. But until we can look at our life, not to beat ourselves up, but to say, oh, I voluntarily walked into death. How many of you have ever been in a relationship that turned into a death trap? Come on now. You've been in a relationship and you're broken, man. It's defeating you. How many of you have ever been in a life situation, but you don't want to own up to the bad decision? I've learned, I've had to go back to my parents on numerous occasions. I mean, you know, my parents were the smartest people until I was 12. Then they ate a dummy pill. And they stayed dumb all the way till I was 20. And then when I turned 20, my parents must have went back to school. All of a sudden they got really smart. Or is it possible I started looking at things in a biblical way? You see, friends, it's important also that the day Adam and Eve walked away from God and voluntarily, this is why we have to see covenant now. It's not who, we already know who Adam and Eve are. They're flawed. They were innocent. They were not, friends, listen now. They were innocent, but it doesn't mean they were sinless. They had the option. They didn't sin, sin yet. But the key is they walked away from God from life to death. How many of you know the born, it, it was the opposite of the born-again experience? The born-again experience is going from death to life, whereas, whereas the reverse of the born-again experience is going from life to death. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But here's what happened. As they walked into death, we want to know who is God? What's God going to do about it, covenant? And it's important we know this is more than just a physical death. See, a lot of theologians wonder, why didn't Adam and Eve get snuffed that day? Why didn't they get taken out? Why did they live 900 years or so? It doesn't seem to make sense because he wasn't just talking about physical death. What happened was they came with an expiration date that day. Before, it's eternal. The plan always was you're going to eat of the tree of life and you're going to live forever. And they missed that whole thing. But this is more than just a physical death. This is severing fellowship from God who is love and who is life. Jesus, how many of you agree? Um, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for what? God is love. I am the truth, the way, and the life. So as they walk away from God and they're no longer walking with God in the cool of the evening, all of a sudden they've walked away from the love of God and they walk away from the life of God. But you see, when we cannot be wrong, 
when we can't take responsibility. Ever had that problem? For my own sin, I begin to blame God for what's happening. So watch this. When man walks away from God, he may think he's alive, but in reality, he's already dead. You see, friends, how many of you, what was the movie, The Night of the Living Dead? How many of you know there are people, I've never seen the movie, so if it's really weird, I'm sorry about that. I'm sure it is with a title like that. But there's so many people who think they're alive, and they're already dead. And when you talk to them, they'll tell you, well, there's no life after death. When I die, you're nothing but worm, worm food. It's, it's over, man. The maggots get you, the worms get you, you know, and, 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 and you have no future. And this is something we need to realize. We know many people who are already dead. Because when your spirit is dead, when your conscience has been seared, as it were, with a hot iron, you have no life. You literally, and yet there's people, the animation is still there. Because they are a one-dimensional person, they have a physical life, but not a spiritual life, they're convinced they're still very much alive, if you will. Death is not annihilation. This is where the Seventh-day Adventists get it all wrong. And there's